what's happened here is we, we've basically um, created a biochemical scenario in our bodies where we've raised our blood sugar. Now we want to, to sequester that and we've put the body into storage mode, but we didn't eat a single thing. We were just under blue light or on the phone for three hours. Okay, welcome back to the Regenerative Health Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Max Gulhain. Today, we have a very, very interesting episode, and that is with Dr. Sarah Pugh. Now, Sarah is a postdoctoral PhD researcher who had a long career in research in a, in a range of topics, including genetics uh, and molecular biology, who subsequently trained in and studied uh, hypnosis, functional neurology, Pilates, uh, and, and a whole bunch of very interesting um, complementary uh, medical fields. She's her, her depth of knowledge is is astounding, and in this conversation, we cover a whole bunch of really really interesting topics. Uh, what we talked about that I think is going to be particularly interesting is how our light environment and how how our circadian environment. Uh, influences and causes uh, metabolic disease and diabetes. And we talk a lot about how the solar environment that we're exposed to is influencing our insulin sensitivity or therefore our our ability to tolerate things like dietary carbohydrates and not get uh, metabolically sick. So uh, this is a very, very interesting episode uh, and one I think for people who are particularly trying to reverse metabolic disease, one that they they should uh, listen to. So thank you for watching and onto the podcast. So Sarah, thank you for coming onto the podcast. Yes, yeah, lovely to meet you, Max. I've watched a lot of um, your podcasts, and I'm um, a big fan of yours. Thanks, Sarah. And and look, I, I've been astounded by the depth of your knowledge when I when I've listened to your your recent uh, appearances on, on a whole bunch of shows. And I'd I'd like to get an idea about how you started in in this game, um, and then what led you down the path to kind of viewing health so holistically as you do now. Yes, um, that's a good point, because I suppose I've always been interested in health and supplements. I think I bought my first supplement when I was 16. And uh, what was around then was just sort of fitness and bodybuilding magazines. There wasn't the plethora and there was obviously no Internet. Uh, And then I was really interested in martial arts and um, different ways of eating, even when I was at school. Um, Then I studied um, biochemistry and genetics. I did my PhD and that involved biophysics, but I uh, didn't really understand how light affected the body until sort of 20 years later. And then I think you just end up going on a journey that when I left science, because I was uncomfortable working on statins and cholesterol, but I didn't have the knowledge at the time I do now to realize how bad it was. I just knew I was doing something I shouldn't be. And then the environment of being a scientist can be unpleasant as well. Not the people, it's just a, it's basically being in, in a lab under blue light all day and it's stressful and you're hunched over a, um, a microscope or a bench. So that's what led me into Pilates because I needed to improve my posture and get rid of my backache. And then as soon as you enter the holistic world, that's when you discover everything from Reiki to acupuncture to Chinese medicine to um different ways of eating that are sort of more organized and then things just sort of progressed into uh, medical training in medical ketogenic diets with beth zupet kenya and then exploring how to use fasting with that um and i did actually know about quantum biology quite a long time ago because i follow dave asprey and i think he was the pioneer of you know these are still the original true darks that that uh, these are like really old my glasses so I knew about oh I should be blocking blue light in the evening and I didn't really take it particularly seriously uh, until I ended up you know as I got older I had a few problems and I couldn't resolve them and that's when I really got into Dr Jack Cruz's work it was sort of um, in lockdown particularly um, but that's when a lot of people encountered problems and then I made the link of you're getting worse because you're just inside running an internet business under blue light. Uh, And then once you discover Jack Cruz, I think it's like um, (laughs) a whole other planet, basically. And then I started implementing quantum biology with my clients and I was able to 
get into some of the people I just had no idea why things weren't working. And also I used to turn away clients because I think, oh, I've got no idea where I could possibly begin with this. And now I feel very confident that I go always do the circadian first and then I kind of layer everything else on top. Um, and th that's where I, I, I'm, I'm at uh, right now. I'm actually doing some training with Dr. Tom Cowan at the moment, who's another person who's got a, a very interesting way of approaching the body and disease and um he's written a book on the heart and how it, it's how um it's not a pump and he's very inter interested in water and structured water as well so, so i'm forever learning um uh, if that makes sense yeah no and, and uh look I, I did a year of basic science research at, at a lab as well and i can agree with you that it's an absolutely horrific environment to be spending uh, a lot of time under um, su such harsh and stark light um so that there is a little bit of a um it's 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 uh, pain painful work in that you're often doing very interesting work but it but it's mm -hmm. definitely coming at the expense of health and I, although I didn't want to make this this topic of our talk, I, I'd like to get your brief opinion on statin medications and perhaps what what was the reasons why you particularly were uh, unhappy about continuing to research in them? Well, first of all, from a very simplistic point of view, um, if our body makes something, um, it must be really important. Um, and also, I think it was um, the way in which some of the, the grants were written that they'd literally write you a project and it almost said, this is our hypothesis, please produce some data here mm. and then you can have a publication. So it was almost laid out that you had to, um, it, the project wasn't as free as you thought it was. And it was very, uh, it was a, basically my project was to look at how statins affected beta-2 adrenergic receptors in the heart. And it was just people were desperate for anything positive they could say about statins at that given time because that was the sort of 2007, 2008 era when they were just racking up all of the let's find as many positive things that statins can do and we'll just push that. And, and that's what really made me think, hang on a minute, I'm, I'm not okay with this really because it is a drug and... Yes, I do understand it at the molecular level in cavioli, but I don't really understand what this is going to do to people in their with their cholesterol all over their body. Because I started to look into depression then and realized, well, there's an implication. A, a quarter of our brain is cholesterol. So if you're if depleting cholesterol there, that's going to have implications. Um, I did know enough about sex hormones by then, even though I didn't, that wasn't something I studied in biochemistry to know that if you don't have adequate cholesterol you're going to have trouble with things like pregnenolone your testosterone estrogen progesterone so that that got me slightly well hang on a minute that's another fundamental pathway that's been interfered with with the statins um and then after that i just got really i kind of really fell in love with cholesterol as a molecule and it does just so much more again because i love it from a quantum perspective because it's one of these things we'd call a time crystal and i just say in simple language it's a molecule that can uh, is very important for how we tell the time, whether it's seasonal or during the day. And every day I learn something interesting that even LDL, which really annoys me, people try and say good and bad cholesterol. Well, LDL is just um, a lipoprotein that happens to have cholesterol in it, along with a lot of other things. And then numerous benefits are popping up of the benefits of LDL from immunity to mood um, and all sorts. So I think um, that was the kind of kicker for me that even when I wasn't an expert in quantum biology and I mean I know so much more about cholesterol back then alarm bells were ringing just the fact the quarter of your brain um and then that was sort of what what then made me question everything I, I mean I already knew the saturated fat um data was incorrect I knew about Ansel Keys back then um and then gradually bit by bit more I, I discover a new lie every day <laughs> Whether it's sun cream or sunglasses or sun cream, I, you know, I could go on for ages about it. Oh, oh, drink, you know, as much water as possible until you burst. There's there's all sorts of things that when you follow the money, you think, well, hang on a minute, I don't think I should be doing this. And I think that's another fundamental thing to do with research would be um, follow the money. 
Definitely. It's a very reliable heuristic. Um, and we when we follow the money, we pretty quickly find out um, w- w- where the incentives are lying and then what what health practice or or else is being pushed. The On, on a broad level, and again, we'll, we'll talk about statins maybe another time, but uh, I... I, I'm humble in terms of my, this idea of not knowing exactly what's happening, and and the approach of blocking HMG CoA reductase, which is the enzyme that statin medications block, um, it, it has so many second, third, fourth order effects that we're not aware of, um, and it's in my mind quite um, arrogant um, epistemologically to simply block that one pathway um, in, in a very reductionist way, and then. Um, you know, assume that or hope that uh, the total net benefit is is positive. Um, obviously, this isn't medical advice, um, but uh, that 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 is something that I'd say about about statin medications too. But but let's talk about um, light and let's talk about circadian biology and and, and quantum um, health. And what you just said um, earlier in our conversation is that the first thing you address when you deal with a patient or a client that you're trying to help from a health point of view is that you address their 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 light environment um, and their circadian biology and and I noticed that you didn't say that you um, you know recommend a certain diet or you advise on certain supplements so talk, talk to talk us about this hierarchy of, of approach and, and why you have developed that approach. Okay, well, the, the food thing, I do think it's really important to do um, a ketogenic diet uh, or of sorts. I mean, there are there are probably a thousand different variations, and I'll come back to that. I think it's because it's easy and it's free for people. So when it comes to changing their light environment, first of all, anything to do with food, and you'll know yourself being a medical doctor, people are very touchy and they get offended. So it's a way to build rapport with somebody without offending them especially if someone's got a weight problem so I don't even mention the food or anything to start with because um, even if somebody doesn't want to get up in the morning and see the sunset yet they can still buy blue blockers they can still put iris on all of their devices they'll buy a screen um, or uh, or they can go and stand in their garden for half an hour or 10 minutes before going to bed and that's going to help with the evening routine and the sleeping And also, I know full well um, that if people won't get up and see the sunrise yet, that there's always the UVA rise they can see. And usually with those two things, somebody's going to feel better. Either they'll sleep better or they'll just be in a better mood. So straight away, um, there's been two easy wins for me. And now they're much more on board. Okay, well, this, you know, I like this. That was easy. What what, what can I do next? And then it allows me to start to talk to them. When it comes to food, I tend to talk about how much deuterium there is in the food rather than macros because I like to take I don't like telling people what they've heard a million times I like to come around and bring it in in a different way and that's again a sort of partly my hypnosis or hypnotist background to take people by surprise and if I start talking about deuterium food and we're going to pick things from the red we're not going to eat things in the red box because they've got lots of deuterium you can have things in the orange and the green And we're just going to focus on that. And then people get kind of, well, what about calories and what about fat and protein? It's like, no, just eat the food in this box. It's very simple. Um, And I found that that approach can be really helpful as well, because I'm not treading on sort of people's sensitivities about um, their, their body or blaming them or telling them their diabetes is their fault or whatever. And then especially like diabetes, I think something you're interested in as well. And it's so prevalent. I definitely bring up the blue light very early with people who've got diabetes because I have had people, it is just the blue light. I've checked everything, their diet, their way of eating. I find out where they work and it explains the high triglycerides and the HbA1c almost being borderline, yet everything else, they are doing it really well. And they and they take on board that, they, that, that as well because it's very easy to change your light bulbs. Um, you know, I mean, it's diabetes versus some light bulbs. And the other thing I really like about a different approach is uh, brown adipose tissue, which you can make more of doing cold thermogenesis, is biology's natural defense mechanism against diabetes. And I do have some people who um, 
are very willing or, or actually like being outside. They've just never, they've never thought, oh, swimming in the sea or in my lake, you know, I didn't know. I, I would, I would have gone into a lot more if I'd have known. So, so I kind of approach these things that I come across a lot from a slightly different way. And then again, it's piquing people's curiosity. Um, it's really important for them to, in the beginning, think, oh, this is easy. I'm going to get a good win. But sometimes you can make a huge needle move because most people do know they should and shouldn't be eating certain things and they know they should be exercising. They have absolutely no idea about light and they can, they can, if you know, in your own house, you can control the light a lot. I mean, yes, if you've got a, a husband or a wife that thinks this is all nonsense, it can be problematic, but on the whole people want their spouse or their family or whoever to get better yeah, and, and you, you've mentioned quite a lot there, um, Sarah, and I, and I really love that framing of brown fat or brown adipose tissue as your natural defense against diabetes because for those who, who aren't aware, it's a special type of fat that um, uh, creates heat. So if you promote the, the development of brown ha- fat by, by deliberate cold exposure, then it's a, a real uh, – it's an amazing way to – prevent or, or reverse and prevent against the development of, of metabolic dysfunction. B, may, maybe you could talk about deuterium. And I, I like to get every guest on who talks about circadian health and quantum health to really explain this concept of deuterium from in their own way, because it is a very, very radical and different way of viewing health. I mean, no one, no, no one else is really conceiving about deuterium or the biological effect of deuterium outside kind of this space and um i think it's very important but it can also be difficult to 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 conceptualize so so how do you think about deuterium and 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 tell us about why that's how it relates to food okay so first of all um deuterium is an isotope or a variation of hydrogen um and because it's without getting too technical it's got a neutron um in its nucleus not just a proton and an electron and in terms of um we all went and looked so we've all seen the periodic table whether we liked it or not at school and hydrogen's number one and it's actually in the same group as other metals if you look down with sodium and potassium so technically deuterium is the king of the heavy metals if you want to look at it like that and in terms of health most people whether they know what mercury and cadmium are or not they know that heavy metals are something that's not very nice um but, uh, and however with, with deuterium and heavy metals they're only a problem when they accumulate because um i'm not going to go into heavy metals that's a whole other world but with with deuterium um, because hydrogen and carbon are so much part of us, we're obviously going to be made of hydrogen and we're going to have some deuterium as well. So even though uh, deuterium is a heavy metal, luckily it only exists at something like 150 parts per million. Um, so that would be if you had a litre of water, it would be two drops of it. Um, but because of the way the body works, um, even a few deuteriums that have built up over time start to become a problem so first of all deuterium isn't evil because we need it to grow so babies and flies and e coli love uh, deuterium because it makes them grow very quickly it's just after the age of say 18 or 19 as a human we don't need to grow anymore and that's when the deuterium can turn nasty on us so how does it turn nasty so First of all, um, inside the mitochondria, it relies on a proton pump. So that's just hydrogens going down the ATPase to make um, ATP. If you try and put a deuterium down, because like I said, it's like a big hydrogen. It's like um, an adult um, sliding down a kid's toy or playing on the kid's <laughs> tricycle. It's, it's going to break the ATP. It's going to break your motor in your mitochondria. And when we start breaking mitochondria, then we're going to start to create inflammation or chaos. And that's, as we know, a recipe for disease. The other problem with deuterium is um, it's not quite the same in terms of its sort of magnetic or spin or dipole. So wherever there's a hydrogen in the body, there, there can there's there are going to be the possibility of deuterium. So, for example, something that people um, are familiar with, if you if you end up with deuterium in your cholesterol, when your body wants to turn the cholesterol into testosterone or estrogen or progesterone, the cholesterol doesn't look the same when there's a deuterium in a particular position. So straight away now you've 
um, created a hormone problem um, because there was deuterium um, in the cholesterol and the enzyme that wants to change the cholesterol doesn't recognize it or, or, or in a more sort of physical term, it can just slow down uh, the rates of reaction. Um, but also uh, generally because deuterium is bigger than hydrogen, when we look more into just keep it simple, the mass equivalence, the E equals MC squared, we're just going to say that in our water network and other networks where we rely on hydrogen, the deuterium's bigger, so it provides less energy. And that propagates in terms of sort of simple language. If you haven't got enough energy in your body, you can't detox. You, you Actually, you can't relax. You need to have energy in order to calm yourself down. And also, um, you can't run your immune system properly. Um, so, so basically, I just, in simple terms, it's pretending if I was talking to a client, I'll just say it's this thing that's going to slow you down. And then for, say, somebody who was like a doctor or a scientist, I would go more scientific into it and say, well, actually, there's a significant amount of research in this. And somebody like Dr. Laszlo Boros is a, um, a very well-known researcher in this area. And I'd explain it in a sort of more biophysical way, but I'll always bring it back to the mitochondria, because even if people don't want to accept that they might have got deuterium in their thyroid hormones or it likes to collect in organs as well, that they that nobody can argue with the fact that trying to push a deuterium through a mitochondria is a terrible idea. And the mitochondria will protect themselves as much as possible using the TCA or the tri citric acid cycle or Krebs cycle to keep the deuterium out. Um, and again, just to emphasize, it's not evil. Um, when we are quite good at depleting deuterium, assuming we haven't accumulated too much and we are fundamentally healthy and we're eating a diet that doesn't contain a lot of deuterium. So we poo it out. That's why flies love poo because it's full of deuterium and they want to grow quickly. Um, so, so they like it. Our gut microbiome likes deuterium because bacteria have a really quick life cycle. So again, back to gut health and quantum biology, if the gut microbiome is happy and you haven't tormented it with too much antibiotics or other things, um, it, it can deplete deuterium or get rid of it for you. Sweating is going to get it out. So again, exercise um, some people know, well, I know I should exercise and get sweaty, but I don't know why. That'll help get the deuterium out. And then again, cold therapy helps to deplete uh, deuterium as well. So, so there are lots of natural inbuilt mechanisms that Mother Nature's provided for us to get rid of deuterium. It's just some people, nobody ever told them or they didn't know, or they would say to me, well, I would have gone in a sauna if I'd have known, or I wouldn't have eaten that if I'd have known. Um, so that's sort of one um, angle of, of the deuterium story. Again, there are, other, there are other ways it's a nuisance in the body, but it's also helpful because we do want more deuterium in our blood than um, we do inside our cells because there's specific activities. When you squeeze deuterium or squash it, it can make UV light. So it is part of our signaling network, but it has to be in the right place. And again, when it comes to cancer and growth, deuterium is a growth factor. So deuterium and blue light together, just using a thyroid as an example, if I'm sitting here, I, I have got blocking, uh, blue light blocking stuff on. If I'm sitting here shining blue light on my thyroid uh, and I'm eating a high deuterium diet, it's just a recipe for, for those two together to wreak havoc in, in that gland Um because it's sort of exposed to the blue light and and simplistically blue light sort of plays a role um, in the growth uh, and the taking on board of deuterium and red light and other parts of the spectrum play a role in getting rid of it. That's why it's much easier to get rid of, rid of or deplete your deuterium on the equator. And that's why it's OK to eat uh, pineapples and coconuts because you and the coconut and the pineapple live together on the equator. The pineapple and the coconut have been programmed uh, it, with a quantum stamp from the light, but it also has the appropriate amount of deuterium for that environment. So again, it ties back into this idea of not to eat things that um, don't grow where you live. And, and then another thing, processed food is absolutely loaded with deuterium. And we all know we shouldn't eat processed food. And some people have an amazing metabolism and they can just burn it off. But you can't per se burn off the deuterium. So there are you know thin people who can eat what they want, look good, but they're, they're kind of secretly gathering deuterium over time. And then 
eventually a problem is going to, to come out. So again, when I'm explaining to people about processed food, once they sort of get the idea that there's this thing in it that's this heavy metal that, that, that breaks their mitochondria and it makes them slower in processed food, it, it kind of by themselves, they move away from it a little bit without me having to say, stop eating that, don't eat this, don't eat that, I don't want that in the food diary, why are you eating this? <laughs> it's about people being able to think, oh, actually, I understand now, and I'm just going to not do it anymore. Yeah, and uh, the this idea that you have just described for us of analysing what we should be eating based on the deuterium content, it's, uh, it's revolutionary, it's very, very unique. Because most people, I mean, I guess the, the entry level uh, approach that most people have been taught to think about it is calories. And, mm. you know, we can talk about how the, the food industry have influenced and marketed uh, food and nutrition science to try and uh, brainwash people into thinking that, you know, you can drink as much Coke as you want. Uh, sorry, you can drink a little bit of Coke as long as it's the calories is, you know, fits within your your, your daily allowance. Um, and then the second level, which I think is much more reflective of reality, is the different macronutrients and their effect on our hormonal mm -hmm. systems, and particularly with regard to um, carbohydrates and uh, and fats and, and the different um, effect they have on insulin and, and other um, uh, metabolic hormones. But I guess what, what we're talking about now is that um, what you should be eating is dictated by the deuterium content. And um, w why don't you give for the listeners an idea about, um, and, you, and you, you alluded to it a little bit by the fact that you mentioned that um, deuterium is higher in tropical areas around the equator and in tropical fruits, but how, how, what types of foods contain deuterium at what amounts? Um, give, give us an idea. Okay, so just to keep it simple for people, fat's very low. So the, even the hated lard is um, something like 119. So, so when it comes to levels in the body, um, if you can have your own personal deuterium levels in the 130s, the chances of cancer or diabetes or obesity are very, very unlikely. But when you start to get into the mid, say I'd say 140s or definitely over 150, that's when... Meta, you know, metabolically or health wise, you're, you're in trouble. Um, and again, just before I go into the food, um, our mitochondria make us nice, lovely, clean deuterium depleted water if we put the right fuel in. So the mitochondria have an exhaust, which isn't just the ATP, it's the, the nice, clean deuterium depleted water for all the cells. And, you know, we said the deuterium likes to be in the blood. So, so when it comes to that aspect if you put fat in the mitochondria you get say one equivalent of of nice water out if you put protein in you're going to get um, about 0.75 equivalents of nice deuterium depleted water and then if you put carbs in you get half so, so straight away that's one side of the sort of equation that okay I can make my own deuterium depleted water if I eat predominantly fat and protein and then on the other side it kind of works out the other way that again when you take in protein and fat assuming it's not collagen um you're not bringing a load of deuterium in as well so it's you're less likely to break your atpas however um if you if you start to go into the red box which is all the food sort of over one sort of 47 so that's where you've got grains um sugar unfortunately for me i used to like dark chocolate that's like 170 um but then coffee's really high as well. But then it's the the volume of coffee. Nobody's going to eat a bag of coffee beans. Um, then we've got you know all of our things like coconut water, um, the high deuterium fruit, all the processed foods, all the keto snacks live in there um, in the red box with high deuterium. So, so in a way, if somebody can't comp compute that, they could just eat fat or protein like a carnivore diet, and, and that is a very simplistic way to say, okay, um, just do that. And you're very, very unlikely to overload yourself on deuterium unless you eat far too much. Because again, back to this fast, you know, I, I'm very much, I like to know lots of things work, but I'd like to know why. So if somebody just calorie restricts or fast, they're just putting less deuterium in and chances are they're going to be burning some of their own body fat, which is nice and deuterium free. So that's another way to deplete your deuterium. But if you do want to eat, if it's just fat and protein, um, we've taken away the main deuterium providing foods and we've put the right ingredients in for our mitochondria to make 
um, deuterium depleted water for us. So we've got sort of things, you know, ticking over nicely. Yeah. And, um, you know, when I advise my patients on the uh, ideal diet for them, the first rule that I have is eat seasonally and locally. Mm. And the byproduct of that is based on, you know, where, where I practice in Auburn, New South Wales, um, in winter, uh, what's available. Okay. There's going to be some, uh, seasonal vegetables, but you know, lamb and beef is always available. That's what's, that's walking around in the woods, uh, in at that latitude. So it, it, it's appropriate then, um, especially that a carnivore diet or a very low carbohydrate diet, um, is, is appropriate, particularly at that time of year, um, for, for people living at, at that latitude. And, you know, in, in, in the podcast that I did recently with, uh, Dr. Jalal Khan, we talked about how, um, you know, certain, uh, health health influences and health um, nutritional doctors promote uh, an approach that includes fruit fruit and honey, but uh, which is clearly working for them and and they can maintain a good body composition um, and performance and low amount of ectopic or visceral fat with eating a, a large amount of tropical fruit and and honey. But um, that's because it's appropriate based on where they live, um, mm. and if people who live down in a southern latitude eats that amount of food from um, a different latitude that they're, they're not going to have the same um, benefits and and the reason that you're saying Sarah is that bec- it's because of the deuterium content um, and the the lack of the ability to deplete that deuterium based on the the, the inferior or the reduced amount of solar yield um, compared to the tropics Oh, absolutely. Um, but also um, with the said person in the said location, they're also going in the ocean every day and cold therapy is another way to deplete deuterium. Um, so even if anybody with, with an imagination or if they're lucky can get cold uh, in any part of the world to get rid of your deuterium that way. But um, again, high um, solar yield on the equator is naturally going to deplete deuterium. And also because it's hotter, they're going to sweat a bit more. So they're going to release a bit more that way. So you're exactly right that e- eating um, seasonal and local honey, um, if you live in Africa or Sri Lanka or Mexico, uh, is is different. Um, I, I, what I'm really interested in is what happens if somebody like me with an uncoupled haplotype goes and and does all of that versus somebody with a coupled haplotype. Because what I find actually, I've kind of answered my own question. I think even somebody like me with an uncoupled haplotype that's designed to live in Finland, inbuilt in inside me is all the mechanisms to be able to do really well on the equator. So, so it might be a way for those kind of uncoupled haplotype people to have a superpower in a way if they went on the equator. And I'm not sure how, whether, because I'm so unaccustomed to eating food like that. I'm not sure whether I would. And I'd just be curious personally to think what happens if I go to the equator and do everything there from, from the sun point of view, but then don't eat the the tropical fruit. So, so that's, again, just a sort of discussion amongst ourselves. Do, do you think mm. it would cause me any hindrance? Because, again, all of this fruit there, and I know that if I try not to eat my own apples in my own garden um, when they're all out, I get quite, you know, that's why I would say I'm keto, not carnivore, because I do eat uh, things that are from my own garden because I've tried not eating them and I actually get more, not stressed, but my my ancient physiology really wants those apples. So I'm just curious, maybe you know the answer, what happens if somebody goes and carries on being keto with a very, very uncoupled haplotype, and I'm very cold adapted as well, went onto the equator and stayed keto, so not the same as the person that we know. Yeah, no, that's a very interesting question. And, you know, I've heard people say that they who have been strict carnivore, they went to Bali for a holiday um, with the tropical fruits around and obviously the humidity and the temperature. And it, it sounded very similar to what you described, Sarah. It was visceral and quite physical discomfort at the at the idea of not consuming um, what it, what is obviously locally grown banana or locally grown mango. Um, I, I'm fascinated by that idea of of having the inbuilt machinery to to deal with um, with those equatorial conditions, and and, I, and that makes sense from from the point of view that we came out of Africa and our, our mm-hmm. ancestors, uh, so called mitochondrial Eve, was a well, I mean I guess was an African woman you could say um, that yeah. was the, the 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 origin of our species. Um, so it, to me, it makes sense that, um, you, you could, 
it, it could be inducible, um, but. Uh, I'm I'm not exactly sure um, on on the details. In terms of the haplotype, just explain briefly for the listener, because um, that that can be quite technical. What is the difference between a coupled and an uncoupled haplotype, and why is that relevant for deuterium depletion and everything that we've just talked about? Okay, so, so briefly, without getting into the letters, the the haplotype you're describing is an L. Um, and the haplotype I was describing for me, I'm a T. So, so, that, so um, basically, um, with a, a coupled haplotype, um, you you um, you're designed to be able to run away from lions very very quickly, but you're very energy efficient with your food. Whereas somebody like me with an uncoupled haplotype, I need to take in more food. I waste some of it dissipating heat, um, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. But also there's much more to these haplotypes that because they've evolved um, over a significant amount of time, it's like SNPs or SNPs. There are certain disadvantages and advantages of having a coupled and uncoupled haplotype. I don't know enough about it yet because actually that's something I'm studying, all of the different traits and pros and cons. But, but just to keep it sort of simple, the uncoupled haplotypes uh, do really do fine in the cold and the coupled haplotypes are more of a warm, temperate climate um, person. So they they don't like cold therapy, but they still get the benefits of it. They would just do it at sort of a significantly higher uh, degree than me. Um, but it's not that a coupled or an uncoupled haplotype is better it's all about what what you do, where you live with that haplotype. And what my question, again, back to you is I, with an uncoupled haplotype, will perfectly happily live on the equator. But if I plucked somebody with a coupled haplotype that's very geared for their particular location with heat, the days are the same length all the time uh, there and brought them and plonked them in the UK, that, that particular haplotype plus this weather being away from the equator, having to deal with the cold, a different way of eating um, is not going to be a favorable. But just so people know, it's not better to have one haplotype or the other, but it does quite strongly dictate where your ideal environment or neighborhood is to live. And yes. also it does dictate yes. your way of eating that an uncoupled haplotype is going to be it's more preferable to eat a ketogenic diet um whereas the cup the the coupled one would have evolved on the equator with the with the pineapples and the mangoes anyway so, so that I, I from my current studies and, I, and i'm not going to like go into detail it would look like the uncoupled haplotypes are less good at dealing with carbohydrates naturally but i don't know what happens if you put them on the equator that's why i was asking you this question <laughs> Yeah, no, it, and and for the listener, he, the way I think about it is, um, when we evolved, the the the, the uh, coupled haplotypes evolved on the equator, you know, in Africa, with a massive amount of solar exposure. So if you think about African people, they are rich in melanin in their skin, and that is one of the tools that they can use to actually harvest energy from the sun. So um, that 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 played an, an immense role um, in in helping them survive and thrive in that particular area. But as we pushed north, as we migrated, Homo sapiens migrated in tribal bands um, north of Africa and into Europe, where the temperature was colder, the UV light exposure was less. Then we evolved our mitochondria evolved this. Uh, uncoupled haplotype, which as we talked about earlier about brown fat it, and it's related, is that we were able to um, basically use that electron transport chain to generate heat. And the reason why that would have been beneficial is because um, we had to maintain a body temperature where, um, you know, we're, we're reliant on, we have to maintain our, our body temperature at a very set um, uh temperature um, and without that we would have died so you can see how there was an evolutionary pressure to be able to maintain a body temperature and that is the un uncoupled haplotype that sarah and i are just discussing uh, I, I would suspect that someone who um an, say an african or a coupled haplotype who gets plonked up in northern finland would have a much more difficult way of um surviving and getting by mm. and thriving compared to a transplantee with a, of northern european descent in in the equator based on the fact that though that that um they have an Im immense amount of sun um, requirements um uh, uh in the way that uh, and it was basically a unidirectional um evolutionary adaptation um so so the person from the equator hasn't yet 
uh, adapted those, made those adaptions, but the person who came from Africa ancestrally and then lived in in Northern um, Europe has kind of got the toolkit deep in their their, their genome. Mm. So I mean, that's just my speculation, but um, I guess the, the, to 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 make the point is that we have to respect our ancestry when it comes to um, our diet and the exposures like cold exposure, like sun exposure in terms of health optimization, um, de- depleting deuterium and and making our mitochondria work as well as possible. Yes, and actually, you just reminded me of something about folate and um, UV light. That fairer skinned people, um, not this is not in any way. Oh, sun is bad. It's just um, UV light does deplete our folate. But that's the whole reason why we're supposed to build a tan. And you can do that whether you're a Fitzpatrick one. Um, so I think back to my own question. Um, you one hundred percent. You respect your environment and the sun and. Again, it's back to even if you are from Finland or from Iceland and your skin's very pale, there's still going to be the ability to build a solar callus. But I think, you know, again, if they had to be transported to the equator, I would just think be careful of your folate, but a lot, but but not to, to be afraid of the sun because it's not that's not what I'm saying at all. Um, so what what the what happens is what when you don't have loads of melanin that they don't have loads of uva anyway or b so so they don't need the protection because that's the whole point of melanin again when, when people on the equator have loads of melanin and very dark skin to protect their folate as well um and again you know you eat folate from things which are in your environment and and i think again if somebody from finland was to move to africa they would need to eat the food that was there because it's providing not just deuterium and um or not deuterium it, it provides other important um nutrients and information that are geared for living in that place yeah and it's a good opportunity to talk about um appropriate sun exposure and if if someone does have a Fitzpatrick one skin type or a very fair skin type, then the amount of of UVB radiation that they can take before sunburning um, is going to be a lot 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 less than someone with a very dark skin type. So I I think the messages and especially in my country, Sarah, um, where you know the 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 sun is up there next to um, I I don't know what in terms of uh, you know causes of all human misery but uh it's it's the messages is very very um anti-sun but what 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 i'm saying what you're saying is that it's not about avoiding the sun by it's the opposite instead we need to be very carefully and conscientiously and intentionally um exposing our sun at our skin to the sun and our eyes to the sun at the right time and and basically titrate our exposure based on our um, Fitzpatrick skin type and the fairer we are the less time we'd need before cut, walking into the shade sitting under a tree um, uh, if we if we have a fairer skin type and a, um, yeah so I just wanted to make that point the thing is I'm half a New Zealander so I'm fully aware of what goes on in the New Zealand and Australia because unfortunately you've got the hole in the ozone layer and because I'm a bit of a nerd I always measure UVI indexes wherever I go so, so it is pretty massive in New Zealand and Australia and 100% I agree there's just slap on the sunscreen but also the uh, Maoris and the Aborigines are completely different to, you know um our ancestors who are visitors so they're not really supposed to be living there anyway and and not to bother i don't know about new zealand but um i i know that um the water in australia it is pretty heavy in deuterium so on one hand you've got i mean the northern part is pretty much equatorial you've got enough sun to get rid of your deuterium um, but then your government is very much, and it is, it's the same in New Zealand. Don't go out there. It's dangerous. There's a massive hole in the ozone layer. You'll burn. And then there's a huge, I know that hasn't Australia and New Zealand got the highest rate of skin cancers, but that brings me back to other points. Like, how do you know that people weren't just sitting in the blue light um, inside for ages, eating a lot of deuterium rich food? And that was just basically loading the gun. And then they decided, oh, I'll just go outside and burn, and that pulled the trigger. So then that that gets then the sun gets the blame, even though the blue light and the deuterium were in the background brewing this for for years. Um, and I think this is back to what you were saying about the, the sensitive sun ex, the sun exposure as well, and also again the seed oils that if we've got loads of poofers in our 
um, subcutaneous fat and skin, we're much more prone to burning. I'm so glad you brought that up, Sarah, because essentially we've got this causal claim, and let's pause it out um, for the listeners. You, we've got this causal co- we have got this claim um, that's been pushed by by health authorities that you know you sun exposure and UV light causes skin cancer, and and as you said, in the background, um, we've got all these potential confounders to that relationship, which uh, as you mentioned. Uh, processed foods, uh, seed oils that are not only rich in deuterium, but they have a bunch of um, uh, linoleic acid breakdown products um, like 4-HNE and linoleic acid itself that's being incorporated into the skin cells, into the keratinocytes um, that are going to predispose them or increase their predisposition to inflammation when UV light hits them. So you've got, um, not only got the processed food, you've You've got you're blocking the endogenous um, defense mechanisms with sunglasses and sunscreens because you're 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 preventing the body from building a hormetic response to UV light exposure if you're constantly slathering sunscreen on. Um, and then the predominant light environment that people are exposed to these days isn't sunlight; it's artificial light. And I, and I think that's been lost um, in in terms of the reality of what 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 most people are, are living in. Most people are under artificial light. In the car, they've got the windows up. So again, it's not a natural light spectrum. At home, they're under LED downlights. Um, it, it, at every point, it's not like they're getting natural sunlight throughout the day. So um, we've got all these confounders in the in the in the path of this causal connection between sunlight and skin cancers. Um, and then, if you look at um, you know the epidemiology of this condition, um, both melanoma and, and non melanoma skin cancers. Um, you know, it's gone. It's gone, and particularly melanoma skin cancers. It's gone up despite the imposition of 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 um, uh, these public health measures, and people are getting less outdoor sun exposure. So, I mean, we have to really be thinking. You know, we have to think a little bit deeper than than simply okay, sun causes cancer, skin cancer. Exactly. There's another layer to this, the vitamin D, because everybody agrees that low vitamin D is a big risk for, for all, all cancers and many other diseases. Therefore, people in the know have decided, I know, we'll just supplement everybody with vitamin D, but that's not the same. It's, it's basically, with, without going into lots of detail, it disturbs the whole, the, all the intermediates on the way to making vitamin D, and it can actually cause your body to, you know, if, if you can make it, don't take it. So you stop being able to make your own um, sulfated vitamin D. So they can, they're actually making the problem worse by supplementing, yet it's glaringly obvious if somebody's got low vitamin D, they're they're inside all the time. Because I think a lot of the time when I look at people's vitamin D and it's natural without them taking supplements, it's just an indirect measure of, to some extent, how much time people are spending inside versus outside. Because again, too much blue light and EMFs, even if you're in a good area for UVB, if you're bathing in blue light and EMF, it can inhibit your own natural production to some extent. So I think, again, the vitamin D is a really important part of this, as I would say, cancer lie. Yeah, yeah, t- t- totally. And, it, and uh, you know, we can, I can put in the show notes some papers that show the repeated uh, mm. association of melanoma with low vitamin D. So if, if UV is the problem um, and UVB um, generates, you know, endogenous vitamin D, why are people who are developing melanoma um, almost invariably vitamin D deficient? So, again, it's an invitation to think a little bit more deeply um, a, a, about the whole, a whole, the whole problem. The um, the 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 point I, I want to go back to and really um, expand upon is this relationship of artificial light and metabolic disease and diabetes. Uh, and you tied it into deuterium by mentioning that if we're constantly having a, a if we if our bodies are deuterium loaded then we're going to more likely to develop metabolic cancer and diabetes and as far as i'm concerned they are metabolic diseases they are diseases of mitochondria and and we we look at how cancer cells behave they invariably have broken mitochondria they they're, they're bioenergetic energetic it's a bioenergetic problem um and if we, the, Dr. Doug Wallace wrote a paper, um, the mitochondrial bioenergetic model of disease, which basically lays out how um, all these modern neurodegenerative cancers, um, metabolic diseases, are, are a, a function of or a product of 
um, defective mitochondria. So um, what, what what we're saying or what you, you, you made the point, Sarah, is that um, exposure to artificial light is provoking people's metabolic dysfunction. So, so talk a little bit more about why that may, might be the case and why it's not only a food story. Okay, um, just to add on about the, the changes in mitochondrial morphology, when they look at the mitochondria of type 2 diabetics, they're morphologically different and they're smaller in a bad way. So again, that that's more than just a food story. Well, well first of all, with the, with the diabetes, if we just start with, say, the non-native EMFs, uh, and just to keep it simple for the listeners, our bodies and our genetics and our biochemistry has evolved over millions of years to communicate with only the terrestrial sunlight. So, so we're, we're geared to work within a, a given range, which is the UV range, and then all the way up into the, the infrared. We, we haven't got the, the the appropriate kind of biochemistry yet, and uh, maybe humans will evolve to, to deal properly with other waves, which would be Wi-Fi, uh, radio waves, microwaves, and stuff like that. So that invisible light um, is fundamentally going to provide a confusing signal to our mitochondria because humans are a sort of giant amplifier that... Um, light can land on us even a small amount and that signal can get propagated through and then the mitochondria get the message about our environment uh, the seasons whereas if we're giving the mitochondria this really strange sort of um light the um the wi-fi the the, the non-native emfs the microwaves is going to create chaos uh, and chaos like from a biophysical word is just our way of describing inflammation and again inflammation can be t- synonymous to mitochondrial dysfunction it's just going to cause systemic disease and things like diabetes and cancer are a systemic sort of condition in the body um and there wasn't any mention of anything to do with food there we were just talking about technology um did did you want to talk about pom c and the blue light Uh, and because i just say it's to people it's almost like um getting a sugar rush without getting the pleasure of the food Mm. Yeah, sure. Well, definitely. Let's talk. Let's go. Yes, because because I think again, Jalal covered it extremely elegantly in in the podcast, and I highly recommend listening to that episode. It was superb. But, but just again to come back to this idea of uh, the sun gives off slightly different sort of colours or wavelengths of light throughout the day, and we've got this molecule in us called POM C, and depending on what colour light it receives, it'll be chopped up into different peptides that do things in the body. So we've got alpha MSH, which um, can, can regulate appetite, say that's a melanin production. Uh, then we've got um, ACTH, which can increase cortisol secretion. Um, so that's going to push the blood sugar up. And then there's CLIP, which is um, something that's an insulin secretagogue. So that means insulin is going to go up. So we've effectively created a scenario using blue light because when when um, we're exposed to just blue light um, without the other wavelengths, um, to keep things simple, POMSI gets cut up in a way where we've got lots of ACTH, lots of CLIP. So we've got a lot of cortisol, a lot of insulin. So it's the same scenario. We're going to have like our blood sugar will go up as eating something and then our body has to then draw that sugar in um, and insulin in simple words is sort of a growth and storage hormone obviously it's important so i know it's how we survived um, when we lived underground and couldn't access the sun. But unfortunately, that thing which um, is part of our why we're here today, I think is going to be part of why the human race could... Well, I feel in some ways the human race really is under threat. Uh, I'm not sure if you feel the same. Yeah, no. I mean, we've we've created, we've engineered an environment uh, for ourselves mm-hmm. in this day and age that is uh, in, in stark opposition to or incompatible incompat- with our our evolved mm-hmm. biology, and I think that's that's the the crux of why so many people are, are sick and so many people are, are are unwell is because 
individually we're not respecting or collectively we're not respecting our our, our biology and and what we need our, our, our evolutionarily needs the the implications of what you just said are that if you are constantly exposed to blue light um then you are going to make your pre-diabetes your fatty liver your diabetes your obesity um your pcos that's all going to get worse and there are studies that show i mean there's studies showing that um exposure to blue light causes raises hot triglycerides um you know i've i've heard anecdotally from type 1 diabetics that simply <clears throat> wearing blue light blocking glasses um their 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 insulin requirements went down so they were yep. they became they were, they were, they, their their body needed less insulin because they were un, under less blue light. And do you think, Sarah, is it predominantly the the um, effect of cortisol kind of causing gluconeogenesis or, or liberating stored fat in terms of raising the 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 blood glucose level? Oh no, that's a really good question. Um, it has it has to depend on the context. Uh, I'd, that's something that's my next experiment is to wear CGM or to and because I measure my labs and things a lot, um, and other and people like to do experiments and wear things, um, be, because it's a really good question you've asked. Because I want to see how much does it raise the blood sugar or the or the cortisol um, when I don't eat anything. Because the problem there is the act of fasting the cortisol does go up a little bit anyway. So I need to make sure which is me not eating and which is the blue light. So I'm probably going to approach it a slightly different way um, to eat exactly the same thing with the CGM on and weigh it out carefully at the same time of the day under different light environments. Because I think looking, looking at flipping it around and looking at it that way, because sometimes the problem is that um, we eat something and we don't have very good insulin sensitivity. Uh, so the body produces a great big mountain of, of, of it, which then takes ages to go away. So what I'm saying is if you eat the same thing in a different light environment, you're going to produce less insulin because you're more sensitive. Uh, and the, the less insulin you produce over time, you're going to become more insulin sensitive and less insulin resistant. Um, and I don't know. Um, I mean, yes, that there, there are going to be there's going to be a pathway linked to the dopamine um, usage and depletion uh, because of blue light. Because, again, I mean, I'm really interested in thyroid glands, but I have noticed over the years with myself and people, if you've got good dopamine, that seems to trump bad thyroid. So there's fundamentally an energy um production based on dopamine. And again, being a catecholamine is going to tie into sort of being able to raise um, blood sugar similar to epinephrine. Um, and I don't even know whether they're involved in that either. So I don't know the exact answer that you wanted about, is it just cortisol? Um, I think it's a combination of the cortisol and having more insulin for absolutely no reason at all um, than you need, whether you're going to eat or not. So again, I'd be really interested in your thoughts on, on this because I think it's a fascinating topic. Yeah, and look, I didn't know a thing about POMC in, as it related to metabolic diseases until I talked to Dr. Jack Cruz, and he explained that what well, his theory, and it seems to be um, quite um, backed up by what I've been reading, yeah. is that we we evolved this this facility or this um, function, you know, when we were um, you know cave dwelling mammals, nice. um, and and uh, it's it's kind of it's it's a vestigial kind of function that our bodies have um and then since we invented these blue lights it's it's almost hijacked this pathway but not not in a good way but um actually in a bad way the uh, i really want to pick up on the implication of what you just said um just before which is that our light environment is influencing our insulin sensitivity and this is relevant for people who have diabetes and metabolic disease and obesity because it it means that if we're optimizing our light environment, which is allowing ourselves to be regulated throughout the day by the natural um, wavelengths of, of sunlight and avoiding artificial light at night and avoiding exposure to non-native EMF, then um, we can potentially uh, have a diet that is richer in local carbohydrates and, and still remain insulin sensitive, which is what you know Dr. Paul Saldino has learned himself, um, but has not yet realized, I think. Uh, so, I mean, that's the fascinating implication. And that is why 
Dr. Cruz said to me that, um, you know, your first advice to reverse someone's metabolic disease should be correcting their light environment, which, you know, is a big, big head exploding moment for, for us who have trained in more low carb and metabolic type medicine, where, you know, the diet is the first kind of lever that we pull traditionally. Oh no, that's really important. I think it loops back to what I said at the beginning. If if some if something is made too difficult or strict to a patient or a person, they won't do it at all. So it's better to have um I like a multi pronged approach. Um, so so no, I I completely agree. It's um more than just a food story, but I think it's also easier, even if it makes a, a person's head explode on a biophysical level. It's actually much easier on an emotional level to change your light environment. Because as you know, if you mention food on the internet, the whole roof blows off uh, and people get massively offended and wars happen. Whereas people tend to be just, they're not attached to their blue light. Um, They just don't understand. Yes, they're attached to their phones, but that's a whole other issue. Um, But that's one item. Yes, it's not, here's a pretty bad one for non-native EMFs. But I think also, like I was saying at the beginning, if you take people by surprise and tell your patient who's overweight to change their light environment, they'll be like, oh, well, he didn't tell me to eat less and move more. I'm surprised. I'm curious. And, And that's, again, this idea when people get surprised or curious or there's a different emotion, they're much more open to suggestions. This is, again, a sort of hypnosis idea. And automatically that your patients opened up to you or me because I haven't treaded on something sensitive, which is their weight or their diet. And like I said before, sometimes people just change their diet by themselves. They don't have to tell them. They discover Dr. Cruz for themselves because I open the door for them and then they go down it and then they start off, you know, in the, in the earlier days when he was much more amenable to just eating fat and protein and they just um, do it by themselves. And that's even better because nobody told them to do it. Whereas if we tell them to do it, it's always, oh, yes, but you told me to. Uh, kind of things. So, so I'm actually kind of curious about your patient's reaction to when you change, suggest a light environment as opposed to a medication or, or, or a way of eating. Because obviously the patients want the medication, you know, that's the easiest one. They want that one, you would think. Um, but then the light one, I think, is easy. Yeah. And, and to clarify, I mean, I, I, I'm I'm advising for both. And I, again, I'll before I answer the question, I'll make the, another observation is that the people that I've seen who have type 2 diabetes, pre-diabetes, um, all the manifestations of metabolic dysfunction, insulin resistance, uh, every single one of them to me is basically sunlight deficient in that they are they not getting the sunlight exposure or the circadian regulation that they're partic- particularly that they need, and that's the darker they are, you know, at the lower latitudes, you know, it seems like the more likely they are to kind of manifest this. And and I think you know people in the subcontinent is subcontinental origin that they they're very much prone to developing diabetes and and putting down visceral fat and. I, I I think that a cont- contributing factor there is the fact that they're not getting the solar yield that, that their biology uh, requires. But um, w- w- so so that's just been an anecdotal observation for me is that um, in addition to eating carbs and eating seed oils, that that these people and these patients are also uh, def- deficient in in terms of their sunlight needs. But when I approach the the problem, I'm, it's I'm not only talking about light because if we think about a really someone who's really sick with type 2 diabetes and they're on supplemental insulin um you know the 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 intervention that's going to move the needle um is going to be cutting down that carbohydrate level you're not going to halve you know 50 unit units of insulin that's not going halved um simply because of light especially if you're at a low latitude where there isn't a, a, a massive amount of solar yield to play with so i think um you, obviously we're still the food is, is is important that's why my message to, to patients is always mind your food diet and mind your light diet but uh and and obviously they're complementary and if we do all of them like we eat mostly fat and protein or, or a carnivore type approach um and we get get into the sun or we get cold then you know that 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 is where the visceral fat just evaporates um and you know every, people get better from a metabolic point of view very quickly 
Oh, no, I completely agree. Because also, in order to be insulin resistant, they need to be leptin resistant as well. And leptin is definitely my favorite or one of my favorite hormones. And that's got obviously got a strong circadian component because it's hugely tied into the central retinal pathway. But it's also right under the skin. So in the fat cells, so it's going to be able to be communicated with via light but also there's the food aspect to leptin because i've played around with doing the light part perfectly and then eating wrong uh, and some you know unfavorable things happen but then it, it works the same the other way but, but when it comes to doing unfavorable things with the food i'm talking about not just eating just fat and protein eating too often because i believe there are leptin receptors in the tongue so, so that sometimes can be an approach for people i work with okay why not let's change from five meals a day to three and let's have them only when the sun's up and again that's a step in the right direction so I'm getting what I want I want them to eat less but I'm not going to say it openly but then I'm also um, making sure um, a significant aspect of the circadian clock is honored that they're eating three times a day not too often they get up have breakfast see the sunrise and then they have their last meal before sunset. So I'm not creating an insulin surge in the evening, which is going to completely disrupt leptin's message. And then that also um, ties back into what you say that exactly, I, I don't think people nowadays, even if maybe even not on the equator can get, I know there's the experiments with the mass eye eating um, cakes and, and Mars bars and stuff. But for everybody, I think, you know, you can't get away with having the perfect light environment and eating Twinkies and McDonald's all the time. You know, it's um, the, the whole food story does matter as well, <clears throat> because I've tried it out. And if I because I'm pretty good with my circadian rhythm because it's really important. Whereas if I disobey the leptin eating rules, that then I gain weight, um, even though my light environment. I mean, people would say, oh, yes, but you live in the UK and it's a shithole and all of that. But it's not really. My point of my argument is I can do the best I can um, with what I've got and my cold therapy and manage everything. Um, but then if I do start eating when I shouldn't or eating too often or eating after dark, it doesn't work. Um, and I think that's another big issue that, that people have is um, being given permission to eat um, all the time or to cuddle up on the sofa and watch a movie and have a takeaway. Um, I think that's kind of another very terrible sort of circadian problem that, that there is. I'm not yes. I'm not sure yeah. what your experience is with your patients, but I've found if I really can't get them to do anything with the food, it's like, right, okay, I don't care what you do in the day, just stop eating at sunset and let's do this for three weeks. Yeah, no, I love it. And look, look, this, this is one way of thinking about it is what we're eating, which is what is the, yeah. the macronutrient composition or the deuterium comp composition of the food. Then, then the next order is when are we eating it? Um, how frequently are eating? What is the, the meal timing? Um, and then maybe the, the third order is what is the light environment that we're eating our food in? But um, you can see how multifaceted and multidimensional this whole idea of diet is. And and so much of the, the narrative and the, the argumentation online and elsewhere is, you know, is caught up in debating what exactly we should be eating, um, mm -hmm. you, you know, on a calorie point of view or, or all this kind of um, you know, it's really stuck in a quagmire when we can see how important the timing of meals is from a circadian point of view um, and the deuterium, which we mentioned earlier. And I want to make the point that um, from a uh, from a physiological point of view, it's not only your brain that can, that has the clock that controls our circadian rhythm. And for those who have started to look into circadian biology, it's there's a region of the brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is the master coordinator of your body's metabolisms, uh, sorry, your, your body's um, physiological uh, circadian processes. But there's also clocks in your liver, in your gut, in your pancreas, in your uh, adipose tissue. So eating at the wrong time, which is, you know, after sunset, eating a big meal of, um, of after sunset is going to cause its own little type of um, circadian disruption and it's going to cause that um, uh, uh, incongruent or a confusing message to to your body. So I, I agree with you completely, um, 
Sarah. And I think that if we can um, reduce the frequency of, of meal consumption, um, even if we're only slightly increasing the fat and protein, but we're reducing the frequency of meal consumption and we're making that meal consumption during the day rather than at, at, at night, then that people can see definitely um, improvements for sure. Yeah, because definitely Dr. Sachin Panda um, nailed all of that. I think he maybe he's writing another book. He didn't go enough into light because the other aspect about all of this is um, when it's all about, well, why does somebody want to carry on eating chips and burgers and biscuits? Because something when you correct your circadian rhythm and, your, and you reset your leptin, it also controls your appetite and your desire for these kind of foods. And people think they can't live without them, but when they actually correct their circadian rhythm, see, say, the UVA rise and make plenty of dopamine and endocannabinoids and um, MSH, and um, then we've got enkephalins and endorphins, they get high on their own supply um, and they don't actually want to um, eat all of these things anymore. So, so, And also when your leptin's working properly, your body knows exactly how much energy there is on board and um, it's going to regulate your appetite accordingly. If you've got rid of the desire for this food, because I know binge eating is a massive problem for a lot of um, people, then straight away two boxes are ticked. You don't want it anymore and you're not hungry. And that and all that that was all fixed by fixing leptin. Then then if you get off your phone a bit, you're not going to be constantly depleting your dopamine and your body demanding chocolate or biscuits to pop the dope or worse to pop the dopamine back up so that kind of ties into how fixing your circadian biology can be really helpful for addictions especially those which revolve around dopamine um uh which is is all pretty much all of them in their own way so, so i think there's a lot of this thing i i'm very much about even if you think this is stupid what why don't you just try it <laughs> yeah yeah and look, I, I i love how you've you, you brought that point up because it it answers this really critical fundamental point about uh, overeating the um, processed food and weight gain and explains why people are uh, so addicted to processed foods is because their circadian signaling is is uh, is is dysfunctional and because they've developed leptin resistance their body doesn't know how much energy is on board so and I think this is a point that the low carb doctors on, on their own or the low carb movement is missing is that why are people so hyperphagic? Why are people craving processed food? And w w what came first? And the, the answer to that is that, you know, the, the processed foods are inherently addictive, which they are. And, and yeah. I agree completely. But what you and I are saying, Sarah, is that the disruption of the circadian rhythm, um, the fact that we haven't stimulated POMC enough with UV light and natural sunlight exposure, that is, and, and become leptin resistant, that is the signal that's driving overeating, that's driving food cravings, that's driving the consumption uh, or the desire to eat these these uh, these processed foods. And then they obviously feed, it, the, they feed back on, on each other. And obviously there's linoleic acid breakdown products like 4-HNE that also bind to the endocannabinoid system. And I talked to Tucker mm. Goodrich about that. But that, the, the, those are inherent in the food. But what we're saying is there's signals inherent in our environment that is also driving the overeating. So I really see it as the the genesis of the problem. The, in, the, the genesis of the problem of metabolic disease and obesity lies in that circadian disruption and lies in our artificial um, light environment because of the reasons that, that I just mentioned and, and um, everything that we've talked about. So I love it how, and tying back to the beginning of the conversation, is why you address circadian disruption first is because it's like the 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 keystone or the you know the um, angel at the top of the Christmas tree. It's like it's the it's the <laughs> yeah. thing that 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 once we sort that out, everything else will find a way of sorting itself out. Yeah, I usually say it's like killing the chief vampire in Lost Boys. If you get rid of the chief vampire, all the others will go. Um, but also there's another fundamentally really important point I want to bring up. It's the fact that only 30% of the electrons we get are food electrons. So food only accounts for 30% of our actual sort of energy you know, intake as a human being. And again, for people who are completely brand new to this, we can get energy from the sun. I, I mentioned earlier us being a solar panel because the photons can... In, 
excite our, our the electrons in us and that's again a means of gaining energy but also we can use magnetism because we didn't really talk about that and by grounding and that's again another way where disconnected from nature um by wearing rubber soled shoes and being inside all the time we're not connected to nature anymore in a grounding way but also from an energetic point of view that i think you brought it up in one another podcast that when you know we're outside all day or at the beach it's really sunny or we're lying on the grass we just don't seem to feel hungry because we've satisfied our electron need um from from nature and therefore the desire for food electrons isn't there anymore um so, so there's that aspect as well for, for sort of looking at quantum biology sort of globally, because we've talked a lot about um, light and magnetism has not really been mentioned, which is fine. <laughs> and then we've touched on water a bit. So it's sort of tying it all together. That, and you mentioned melanin again as like, I think that's our seventh energy system because we've got um, more energy systems in our body than we think. It's not just ATP and um, the structured water uh, or the electrons that there's more so, so that's the other thing that people are fixated on this idea the only way we can get energy is by eating yeah and and maybe that 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 would be the last topic that we did that we talk about so we don't overload people with information but yeah. uh, i really wanted you to to talk about this idea of uh, a health optimization strategy as an electron gathering exercise and this mm. sounds it sounds very bizarre and esoteric to um you know most people how can health be related to gathering electrons and what does that even mean? Um, could you could you explain it, uh, and expand a bit more about um, about electrons as energy and and why or how we gather them other than um, food? Okay, well, d just sort of in a simple way to start off with, it's like electrons are like money for the cell or like charge. So the more electrons we've got, we've got more charge. And anybody that's used a torch, it doesn't work very well when the batteries are nearly flat. So that's what somebody with sort of like a low redox or a low level of electrons. But the other really important factor is that um, the more electrons we've got in our body, um, like I said, only sunlight can excite the electrons. So the more electrons we've got to start with, the more benefit we're going to get from the sun. But then that means the more energy that we can have, so the more powerful we can become. So th that's one aspect of it um, would be grounding because we can draw electrons in because planet Earth is negatively charged. Um, the other way to view it is um, not necessarily just gathering electrons, but how do I stop them being stolen? Because alcohol is an oxidizing agent. So in chemistry terms, it steals electrons. Um, and also, unfortunately, as much as people love their tech, that's an electron stealer as well. So that's going to um, affect um, how many electrons you, you, you've got. Um, also, um, the, the way that the tech spoils it all is it uh, makes the exclusion zone smaller. And that's fundamentally how um, we, we've got our sort of water network, how the electrons actually get around the body and um sort of sort of our energy system i'm not going to go into proton wires um, now because it might be a bit too much so again thinking about how can we not lose electrons um is really important as well as how can we gather them in so obviously grounding and that can not that doesn't necessarily mean standing on the grass you can touch a plant that's planted you can sit on a metal bench assuming it's sort of not connected to some kind of unpleasant electrical network you can stand in a puddle you can walk on the beach you can uh, get into the sea you can swim in a lake and all of these are going to be electron gathering activities. And the more you do it, there are lots of studies on um, grounding, you know, that there are benefits to doing it for over half an hour on blood flow and inflammation and stuff like that. So there is this fundamental idea with inflammation. If, you, if you've got too many protons or H pluses and not enough electrons, you're going to have inflammation. So it's so if you think about gathering in as many electrons as possible and don't let things steal them or don't take things that, that are going to steal them, that's a sort of way to sort of approach life in a sort of simplistic way. But also it's actually very accurate biophysically as well. And again, lots of people um, avoid talking about physics because they think it's complicated, but it isn't really when you get into it. And it actually makes things have a lot of sense because I just think about things in terms of protons and electrons and what are they doing um, and, and, it, and it's really helped me understand 
a lot of things I didn't about biochemistry or supplements or keto diets, but then I can also explain it to patients as well. And also if somebody wants to get into a debate, it's very hard to um, disagree with the fundamental laws of physics, whereas I can pull apart pretty much any randomized control trial um, in five minutes. I mean, yes, we have our studies that we quote, but fundamentally when we read them, there is always something wrong with them. And I'm not being horrible to the authors. It's just there's always something wrong with them somewhere. Uh, whereas the laws of physics, as the, you know, that that's very difficult to disagree with. Yes, it is, isn't it? And look, look it, it, the way I think about it, and and I am not um, by any means an expert on the the biophysical um, body uh, per se, and it's something that I'm learning more about myself. But essentially, we are uh, electrical beings, and we are, uh, we all uh, animals. Um, have an electric charge and the the process and when, when we respect that um, reality um, and see ourselves as almost like a battery then um, you know charging yourself up by plugging yourself into the earth makes sense um, as well as you know getting sunlight um, and avoiding you know potentially things that discharge you like uh, non-native emf sources like uh, technology and wi-fi 5g these types of things and um, that's a, that's a very in-depth question, uh, topic and podcast we've just recorded, Sarah. And did you have anything that you wanted to mention in closing um, that we might have mentioned or not mentioned? Um, I think always, people, I always try and give people practical advice because no matter what, people want to eat cakes and play on the computer and drink wine. And I'm not saying don't do it, but uh, can you just do, go and do it outside mm. uh, and it'll that's that's what I always say because if you take away everybody's treats then you know we have to have some joy uh, you know um so just go and do it outside that's what I do with my phone um if I'm gonna do do something even if it's working or editing a video or whatever I'll go outside and do it and sit grounded even if I'm cold it's tough you know um and then for people who want to eat and drink things that they enjoy uh, do it outside yeah, that's a great um, piece of advice. And I was just outside before um, on my computer, um, and the the amount of blue light that's being emitted from your laptop screen um, relative to the sun is is more is so negligible. So the 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 best case scenario is um, setting up your outdoor workspace outside. Um, if you can get your feet on on the ground on, on some grass, that's that's a that's great. And um, again, to 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 emphasize the point that that we made about diet um i, I still think a low carb uh, um uh, ketogenic for, in, for most people is a default great diet um and with the addition of seasonal um seasonal fruit if you don't have pre-existing metabolic disease which is you know 88 percent of americans sarah um, it's it's difficult to add this nuance because people want the simple answer. But I think you know eating locally and seasonally kind of is really the most simple distillation of both your deuterium advice and and kind of what I'm saying with regard to to diet. Oh no, I agree. Um, but but I still think um, that people have to think it's a work in progress because mm. even though I've trained in ketogenic diets and I, and I have done it like before by myself for over a decade, I, I still did loads of things wrong and, and, and ate the wrong food at the wrong time. And it's all a massive work in progress and you can't get it perfect the first time. And even if somebody, like we said, just eats three meals instead of four, that's a really good start. But I always you know, I always think no matter what, you can always do better. Um, but you don't have to do it this moment. But it would be nice if you could um, maybe um, sort of not, not to eat so many pears, please, even though they're local and seasonal, because you don't need 10 pears, because <laughs> there are things like that as well but but also to all you know to always think because as i get older i always think okay well what 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 am i def deficient in and, and what what can i do uh, to offset my aging so, so the thing that i've got left now is to to get fully into the full deep ct because because i've only done sort of down to 55 degrees and so i've never called gone thermogenesis to, yes the cold thermogenesis and i've never been to the equator so when I talked to Dr. Cruz, that was the one thing he said, oh, well done, you're doing really well with the cold. Well, I've known about that for about eight years. 
Um, but I've never actually gone on the equator and lived there for a bit to see what happens. So I think that's the other thing for people is to, you know, not to berate yourself, but to always think, OK, I'm going to be getting older. What can I do to kind of constantly um, delay the process? And I think I'm what I'm trying to say is some people try and just do everything perfectly straight away and they can't do it. And they think, oh, this is rubbish or they binge eat. And then uh, other people say, oh, well, you know, I've done what you said. I've uh, eaten three meals, not four. Um, and I'm like, yeah, but that's just one thing. We've got like a whole journey to go on as well. And and also different things move the needle in different people. Sometimes food, like just taking out something that's got histamines in it can be a massive game changer for a person. For somebody else seeing never missing a sunrise, another person, it can be just buying blue blockers. But I always think you, you need to try all of these needle changes same with ways of eating i'm very much well don't slag it off just do it i've done vegan i've done raw keto vegan i've done carnivore i've done fasting i've done like three to one um almost epilepsy keto diets because it's like you don't know what you don't know and, and always be open-minded and always try something and like you saying just because something works for one person in costa rica it doesn't mean it's going to work for you and not to give up either, because there are so many different variations. And, and like you said, we have gone quite detailed. But I've tried not to go into super geek mode. And there's always nuances. or But you have to sort of make those first steps and changes. Definitely. So use yourself as an experiment. Try everything out. Uh, if you're medicated, yeah. see a doctor. <laughs> don't, yeah. don't, don't necessarily do it all yourself. Um, no. And yet yeah, see someone who has some understanding of these different approaches because, like you said, Sarah, we don't want people to give up because um, no. they tried one thing that didn't work yeah. for them. And also there's so many different flavors of carnivore. I mean, you can have carnivore um, that doesn't have dairy in it. You can have a carnivore with fish because we haven't even gone into DHA because that's mm. another one of my favorite topics, but it's too late now. Um, and you can have um, keto that's got fruit in it and pears and even keto desserts. And you can make, there are ways to make, you know, low deuterium things. I think once you understand the fundamentals and and, and it works, and I think also sometimes people don't mind what they're eating as long as they're getting a result. And that can be really important as well. That if, if you're not getting the result that you expected from doing this way of eating, it might be worth asking somebody to just have a quick look at it and also to look at your light environment as well. Because sometimes it really it, it isn't the food and sometimes it actually genuinely is the food. Is the food, yeah, yeah. Mm. And look, I, I, I favour a, a, a kind of raw seafood carnival myself when I'm living at low latitudes. Um, that seems to work the best for, for me. Um, but yeah, a, a, everyone's going to be slightly different and um, talking to someone who has some understanding of these different approaches um, I think is is going to be the key for for people. So um, so thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you for your very very interesting um, hour and a half discussion. And um, yeah, maybe we'll have to have another chat sometime about uh, about DHA and maybe melanopsin and a whole bunch of other stuff that we haven't uh, talked about. Um, oh yes, so, um, irisin. Yes, there's all sorts of glorious um, things we can go into. Mm, great well um you you actually win the prize for the coolest pair of blue blockers that uh anyone's worn on my show so congratulations All for right. that yeah these are the, the the original dave asprey true dark um yellow glasses and i have to say they are pretty good i've still got the red ones you know the full wraparounds and they're absolutely well, superb yeah. if, you, if you're a bad sleeper the the red ones that are literally glue themselves to your face are brilliant um so Amazing. yeah i'm glad i've won the prize of um the, the best blue blockers <laughs> and uh where where can people find you where can they like listen to your content um and maybe even consult with you if they um if they're interested all right i, I go by busy superhuman on tiktok um youtube and instagram and i've got different posts and content on different channels long form short form and pictures um, and then, yes, I do do consultations, but I'm currently um, now doing a, an affordable monthly group membership. So that's for anybody who wants to learn about quantum biology, have their ways of eating, troubleshooted, um, help with what's a quantum day, people that just want to try and understand Dr. Cruz or all sorts of things. And it's the kind of um, place if, if, it, if you don't like it and it's not for you, it's only a month and you don't have, you're not locked into anything for a long time. 
and that's the that's where you can <clears throat> sorry find me amazing we'll we'll include that in the show notes um so people can uh, get in touch so thanks again sarah um have a great night Oh, yeah. Thank you, Max. It's been absolutely superb talking to you. I, I love the way you um, decode everything in so simple language for the listeners. I think that's that was the best part of all your Dr. Cruz podcast was your um, Cruz whispering, basically. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thanks. Uh, yeah. I try and make it uh, in- understandable. So, um, yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. Mm-hmm.